Welcome back, everybody. Back in the dugout, episode 19, week 19. Uh, this is probably coming out a day later than I expected again, just because my schedule with other work is kind of, you know, up in the air as of now. Uh, playoffs coming up in the Frontier League, but still trying to bring you memes. Don't really have time for the picks as much anymore, but memes and the show every week is what I'm really trying to nail down. Um, but we're just going to jump right into our news today. We got Jesus Aguilar being designated for assignment. He cleared waivers earlier this week, uh, so he was officially released, and it did make room for Garrett Cooper, who was coming back from the IL. Aguilar, if a team does not want to sign him for what his salary is worth, he can sign a prorated league minimum. He is batting around 235 this year with a 674 OPS and 106 strikeouts and just an 89 OPS plus. Uh, he does play a decent first base, does provide good power, um, but, you know, it did not really work out this year in Miami, not just for him, but also for the team, not really getting a lot of other players, and also Jazz, Miz, Jazz Chisholm missing a lot of time. So Aguilar might sign, you know, with a contender who needs a power bat, a DH, or first baseman. So I think he'll probably find a spot on a roster, but as of now, he is, you know, not on the Marlins anymore. Also wanted to highlight the Dodgers' last 50 games. I believe they're 29-8 and eight since the All-Star break and 52-15 and 15 in their last 67 games. They were the first team to 90 wins. Uh, they have two of the best pitchers in the MLB, as we know, Tony Gonsolin and Tyler Anderson. Uh, they are missing other pitchers. Kershaw's been in and out, also missing Walker Bueller. But they also have an, in, an incredible lineup. They got six hitters with an OPS plus over 100. They've also won their last seven series in a row. And, of course, they have Freddie Freeman, who's always going to be Freddie Freeman hitting over 300 with a lot of doubles and RBIs. And then they also have Mookie Betts, another former MVP, similar to Freddie Freeman, who is going to be the Mookie Betts that we always know and love. So that team is really, really stacked. Also got Will Smith, who, you know, is going to the WBC, as we'll talk about later. But just wanted to highlight the Dodgers, who are, you know, obviously the team, the league's best team right now. Uh, just one of the most dominant teams up there um, in the MLB. And I believe a World Series favorite. But the Astros are a team that they do have to watch out for. Next, we're going to talk about J-Rod's contract extension. $210 million guaranteed, but could go up to $470 million which would be the biggest contract in the big four uh, North American pro sports ever. J-Rod did get a standing ovation from the Seattle fans um, when he did play his next game after the signing. So you can tell Seattle's very pumped with this star that they have and most likely a rookie of the year. His base deal will go until 2029 for 120 million. After 2028, the Mariners do have an option to sign him for an additional eight or 10 years, depending on how many finishes he has in MVP voting. Um, and then if the Mariners turn down that team option, Rodriguez can then sign a player option for five years. So a little bit shorter um, for an extra $90 million or, and he can hit free agency after 2029. So a lot of, you know, weird clauses in this contract, but he is a young player. So it's depending on how he performs going forward. But as of now, he does seem to earn that $210 million guarantee. We got the World Baseball Classic news that we just referenced, but we got a couple more players. In addition to Will Smith, we got Kyle Tucker also joining the squad and Trey Turner. Real Muto and Will Smith are making the, they make up that backstop with the uh, Real Muto being starter and Will Smith being backup, which is absolutely filthy. Will Smith has the most home runs in the MLB since 2020 with 59. Trey Turner, we know Trey Turner, one of the fastest players in the MLB, two-time All-Star, World Series champ, Nationals hero. So the, and the, so the squad is basically looking like right now we got JT Romuto, Will Smith at catcher, Pete Alonso at first, Goldschmidt at first, Trevor Story, second base shortstop, Tim Anderson shortstop, Nolan Arenado third, Mookie Betts right field, outfield, Cedric Mullen center field whatever outfield position they need. Mike Trout also in the outfield, Kyle Tucker in the outfield, and Trey Turner um, rounding that out right now in the infield. And the third player that I mentioned, Kyle Tucker, has a 130 OPS plus 
and an 842 OPS in five years in his career thus far. Another great young up-and-coming player, and he did make his first All-Star team in 2022. We got some injuries that we are dealing with. We got Shane McClanahan. He was scratched from his start this week on Tuesday against the Marlins with left shoulder impingement. Uh, you could see on his face that he was fairly upset with what occurred in his bullpen session. He is 11-5 this year with a 2-4-1 ERA. To front runner, maybe not the first favorite, but up there for AL Cy Young. He is one game up in the wildcard spot. That is the Rays. So with them missing Shane McClanahan, we'll see how that team pans out further because he obviously has been their MVP at least. Um, so he is a big hole to fill in their rotation. Next, we got Joan Duran throwing the first 100 mile per hour off speed pitch through a 108 mile per hour splinker, which I think is like a splitter and sinker. He threw it to Alex Verdugo of the Red Sox. First time will be pitch over 100 miles per hour. That is off, like considered off speed. Uh, he has the highest average splitter speed at 96 miles an hour, highest four seam speed at 100.7, and the second fastest curveball at 87.7. And 87.7 back in the day was a pretty decent fastball, but he's throwing a curve at that speed. And he has also thrown 68 of the fastest splitters of all time. So just following that trend of electric arms, fire starters coming out of the bullpen, and John Duran is definitely one of those guys who is paving the way with the splinker. Next, we've got Tori Lavulo being retained by the D-backs. He's being extended through 2023 with that team option. He was retained the day after one of the largest comebacks or the largest comebacks in Arizona Diamondbacks history. It's down 7-0 against the Phillies in the fourth inning, I believe. He is in his sixth season in Arizona, and he has been the longest tenured manager in Diamondbacks history. And six years is not a very long time. So it just shows you, uh, and it's also why they signed him to this extension, that they don't really have a lot of success in terms of managers. He was the 2017 NL Manager of the Year. His career record is a bit shady at 397 and 438, but he does have a postseason win. Um, and the team right now in Arizona is very young and very promising, kind of in a rebuild. They haven't really been in a you know high enough position to consider it a rebuild, but maybe you know a retooling with Alec Thomas, Corbin Carroll, who came up, and Stone Garrett. Another pretty bad, but not not really concerning injury. We got the other AL Cy Young favorite. Justin Verlander dealing with a calf injury. He was placed on the IL with said calf injury, but the MRI showed no fiber, no muscle fiber disruption. So I'm assuming, you know, he doesn't have a strain or something seriously wrong with his muscle in his calf. Uh, he was injured in a rundown and he was pretty concerned because he did say he felt the pop, but the MRI revealed that it was not as serious. He is 16 and three this year with a 184 ERA. He is just incredible at such an older age. He just seems to be just fantastic for so many years. This is like LeBron of the MLB. Astros have 84 wins, and they do have a decent rotation without Justin Verlander, and he's only going to be out for about 15 days on the 15-day IL. And he believes he was lucky because he was a bit concerned, and I bet the Astros feel a bit lucky too. We also got Tony Gonsolin being injured, an NL, young, NL Cy Young candidate up there. He was put on the IL with a right forearm strain tied with Verlander with 16 wins. He ascended, you know, in that Dodgers rotation after Bueller and Kershaw went down. Kershaw much less, you know, much less um, detrimental, but it hasn't missed a decent amount of time. The injury bug is kind of messing up the Dodgers, what they have, but they are still the best team in the MLB. They're still very, very elite. Gosselin did not need an MRI and will probably miss about two starts himself, similar to Justin Verlander. But the Dodgers have an 18 and a half game lead in the NL West, and Michael Grove is coming up in AAA to fill that rotation. So being up 18 and a half games, nothing really to worry about too much, but you do want to get Tony Gonsolin back for the final stretch and the postseason being one of the best pitchers in the MLB. We have Pujols hitting another home run, hitting it off his 450th. Pitcher, it was his number 694, it went 369 feet. Hit it, also, hit it off of Ross Detweiler of the Reds. Broke that tie against hitting a home run against the most pitchers at 449 with Barry Bonds. 
He has eight home runs in August. It is his most home run in a month by a player at the age 42 or older, tied it once again with Barry Bonds and Carl Yastrzemski. He hit just seven home runs between the months of April and July, and he's hit eight in August, so some sort of resurgence for Albert Pujols. He is two home runs behind A-Rod in terms of the all-time list at 696. And he has hit 15 home runs in 21 seasons, which once again is tied all-time with Barry Bonds. So Albert Pujols really stringing it together, you know, chase for 700. And I'm thinking maybe pitchers might be lobbing it in there. It's sort of like an all-star game type thing where you're just putting it in there for him. But I don't think that's true. Um, Still flashing power that he had when he was the most dominant hitter in MLB history and in the league. Next, we got Dallas Keuchel being signed to the Rangers, signed a minor league deal there on July 26 with John Gray and Spencer Howard hitting the I.L. Keuchel's on his third team this season, including the White Sox and the Diamondbacks. He allowed seven earned runs in his first start with the Rangers across five and one third. This season, he has two and six with an 8.44 ERA and a putrid 46 ERA plus. His whip is also over two, which is very, very bad. And his hits per nine is at 14. Just very, very sad numbers, a far cry from his Cy Young season. And I feel like I said that so many times this year, just with Dallas Keuchel signing different minor league deals. And, you know, you're hoping he signs to a team and he can, you know, have at least one good start, a little bit of a resurgence. But it doesn't seem like that's really happening with Dallas Keuchel this year. Next, we got O'Neill Cruz, another another just incredible feat of just athleticism with a 117 mile per hour home run. Another accomplishment for Cruz in his first year, while his average numbers are you know down, he does have these incredible plays, flashes of absurdity and greatness. He hit that 117 mile per hour home run off of Corbin Burns. It is the hardest hit home run by a Pirates in the Statcast era since 2015. He has four of the top eight fastest hits in Pirates history. He hit the ball. He hit a 122 mile per hour ball last week, I believe. Um, And his first major league hit was a 118 mile per hour single. And we know that he also can throw the ball across the diamond at, you know, a hundred, not a hundred, but like 95, 96 miles an hour, just a super electrifying figure, similar to Fernando Tatis, of course, before, you know, the steroids, but just an all around stud at six foot seven at shortstop. Finally, we got Tony La Russa out indefinitely. He is seeing a heart specialist and does not know if he will return for this season. He is 77 years old and the oldest manager in professional sports. He missed the game earlier this week on Tuesday with Miguel Cairo serving as the interim. It is kind of concerning. Tony La Russa is, you know, up there in age and, you know, managing your baseball team and getting all this all this flack from the press and fans and 162 games is long enough on, you know, a player at 30 or 35, but the Russo doing it at 77, uh, you know, the White Sox have really struggled and, you know, he probably has been struggling this year if he's seeing a heart specialist. So we wish him a speedy recovery, but that's all for our news. I don't really think, I don't even think I did any picks, you know, as I said, cause work has been really, the schedule has been, you know, up there. Um, but You know, no picks this week, but still watching a lot of baseball and still loving my job watching baseball, writing about it and researching it. So that's all we got for our news. We're going to do Young Guns and Old Heads of the Week after this. So for our Young Gun of the Week, we are going to start out with Willie Adamas, who we are going to mention actually later in the show as well. Got a birthday this week. Willie Adamas, 27 years old. He went 11 for 32 this week with 20 total bases, three doubles, two home runs, and seven RBIs. He went three for four with a double and a home run versus the Dodgers. You know, the front runner of the league, if you're doing great things against the Dodgers, you are yourself a great player. It was against Andrew Heaney, you know, one of the weaker arms in their rotation, but still the Dodgers are the Dodgers. Willie Adamas hasn't really had as much promising season as last year, the second half when he came over to the Brewers from the Rays, because he really, really was hot out of the gate in Milwaukee, but he has really slowed down this year, hitting around 250. He does have more home runs and more RBIs this year, and his barrel percentage, I believe, was much higher. So he is hitting the ball harder. Um, you know, driving in more runs. So maybe the average will suffer a bit, 
but he is an influential player on that Brewers team who are two and a half games back in the NL wildcard spot. And another Young Gun of the Week who's on the show every week. He could, he's like Paul Goldschmidt. He could be on the show anytime he wants, but we got Sandy Alcantara, 26 years old. He beat the Dodgers himself this week through a complete game, allowing six hits in one earned run on, one, on a home run. So other than that, it was pretty effective besides the home run and also struck out 10. It is his most strikeouts since July 24th, and he was rebounding from a six earned run start against the Dodgers a week before. So coming back against the really, really scary, really tough Dodgers and having a complete game after, you know, Kind of having a rough start of it is very, very impressive for Sandy Alcantara. He is now 12 and 6 this year with a 2.13 ERA and a sub one whip. Just incredible numbers. I feel like pitchers, especially, and rookies, even themselves too, but most importantly, pitchers having an incredible year this year. Maybe it's the change balls, you know, whatever the new rules are, whatever your conspiracy theory is. Pitchers are really, really productive, especially Sandy Alcantara. And opponents are batting 205 against the Miami Marlins stud and another NL Cy Young favorite up there in those ranks. So congratulations to those guys. And on to our old heads of the week. First off, we got Mike Trout, 31 years old, of course, on the Angels. He went eight for 24 this week with 18 total bases, three home runs, a double, and five RBIs. The Angels are five and three over this stretch. They did win their series against the Yankees, who are very, very mightily struggling, and also swept the Blue Jays. And those two teams are contenders in their division and in the wild card. So it's good to see the Angels possibly ruining the AL East with their surprise victories with Mike Trout coming back. It's good to see Mike Trout back after dealing with that weird, scary whole debacle with the back injury when you didn't think he was going to come back and then he's going to have to deal with it his whole career. And then he got another diagnosis, and now he's back hitting three home runs in a week. Uh, So maybe the Angels and Mike Trout can, you know, they're pretty much out of the playoffs or very much out of the playoffs. Maybe they can, you know, ruin some teams seedings in the wild card and, you know, make an impact. So that's pretty, pretty good for Mike Trout. We also got Rich Hill and Rich Hill could have been a surprise this week, but I went with him for old head of the week just because he is 42 years old and no offense, pretty up there in age for the MLB. He beat the Rays this week. He allowed three hits in seven innings in 11 Ks with zero earned runs. It is his first shutout start since May 5th and his first double-digit strikeout game this year. It is the most strikeouts he has this year by five. Is the highest before, of course, being six. He is two and one in August with his best ERA in a single month this year. I believe it's three. Uh, and he's four and one in his last seven appearances. So after a shaky start with Rich Hill, and I believe he did miss some time earlier, he is really putting it together in his last seven appearances. He beat that contending Rays team, another team that they can hope to soil their, you know, their hopes being that the Red Sox are also out similar to the Angels. Hopefully they can make a difference and, you know, really mess up some teams' stretches going down into the playoffs. But those are our old heads of the week and our young guns of the week. We're going to be back with our surprises of the week, as well as some of our prospects going forward. So for our first surprise of the week, we have another pitcher who is the opposite of Rich Hill, kind of had a very bad week this year to be very promising. We got Johnny Cueto, whose entire season can kind of be a surprise, but he has struggled this week, allowed seven runs and five innings against, you know, the Diamondbacks who aren't really much of a threat. He allowed two home runs in that game, and he was coming off two dominant starts in which he pitched over eight innings at his old, not old age, but 35, 36. It's impressive. Justin Verlander kind of, you know, muddles this with just how great he is right now, but Johnny Cueto himself having dominant starts this year. Cueto allowed his most earned runs all season with the seven he did allow this week. And it is the only, it's the second time he's allowed over three earned runs in a game. So just another pitcher, another older pitcher having an incredible season, but this week did struggle. It was his shortest start all year at just five innings pitched. He did have a comeback season, as we have discussed many times before. 
it is just a small hiccup, although be it, you know, seven runs is a lot, a pretty big hiccup. Um, he is the White Sox second most reliable arm behind Dylan Cease with Kopech being on the injured list, Giolito not really being what they are looking for, and Lance Lynn, you know, coming off an of injury and not really being the player he was last year. So, you know, Johnny Cueto will probably have a few more good starts going forward before the end of the year, but this week did struggle against the Diamondbacks. And our second surprise of the week, probably one of the biggest surprises all year in terms of, you know, this week in terms of struggling, we have Rafael Devers, who went on an insanely cold streak this week, three for his last 29 with eight strikeouts. He hasn't gotten a hit in his last five games. He's hitting 163 in August compared to July when he was hitting 300. And he entered this month batting 324, and now he's hitting sub 290. His OPS dropped from 992 to 873. Still good numbers in terms of average and OPS, but he was otherworldly in terms of those numbers entering into August. He is driving down his value a bit right now, although he is obviously a star in the MLB. This could hurt his value a little bit. I mean, 287 and 873 OPS is still incredible, like I said, but just not, it's a bad sign to see your player kind of tapering off at the end of the year after such an incredible season. The Red Sox, of course, are kind of in a limbo position, finishing this week three and five. Um, but just in terms of the entire year, kind of in limbo with they got Bogarts, Trevor Story, who they just brought in. They got a star in Rafael Devers, but they also have young players that they can rebuild around. Their pitching rotation has been injured and in so so all year, uh, with Chris Sale as well being injured. So Red Sox are kind of in limbo. Rafael Devers might be in this kind of limbo mindset. Uh, so it was kind of a shady, shady week for Rafael Devers. But on brighter terms, we got our prospects of the week. First, we got Garrett Mitchell, the Brewers' number five prospect, 23-year-old outfielder, the 20th pick in the 2020 shortened draft. He batted 342 with a 901 OPS and nine stolen bases in 20 games in AAA this year before being called up. Debuted this week against the Cubs with Jonathan Davis going down with an injury in center field. Garrett Mitchell got his first hit in the second game uh, with a single in the MLB. He hit a home run in his third game, and he now has two hits in nine at-bats with five RBIs, which is very, very impressive in five games with the Brewers. So shout out Garrett Mitchell. Next, we got Corbin Carroll, the Diamondbacks' top prospect this year and the third prospect in the MLB pipeline. He's 22 years old, another outfielder. He was the 16th pick in 2019. He hit 313 with an OPS over one and 20 stolen bases in 58 games in double A. And then called up to triple A, hit 287 with a 943 OPS uh, with 11 stolen bases in 33 games at that level. He debuted this week against the Philadelphia Phillies and got his first hit then. And he this week so far, he has three hits with three RBIs in two games, and he also also has blazing speed running around the bases. So another promising Diamondback who we mentioned earlier with Stonewalker um, and Alec Thomas. So shout out Corbin Carroll and the Diamondbacks in the bit of a rebuild right now. And our third prospect got called up yesterday, I believe, Gunnar Henderson, Orioles' top prospect and seven, second overall prospect in the MLB pipeline, 21-year-old infielder, he was the 42nd pick in 2019, and he will join the Orioles with the roster expansion, you know, going down the stretch. He hit 312 with a 1025 OPS in double A with 49 hits in 47 games. And then in triple A, hit 288 with an 894 OPS with 11 home runs and 13 doubles in 65 games in triple A. So really shining in both, both levels. So they, they had no, no option but to call him up to the major league squad. He started at third base last night and can play depth at any other infield position. He hit a home run in his first MLB at bat. And I feel like we talk about this all the time. There's been so many hitters, three or four or five rookies this year who have hit a home run in either their first game or their first at bat, just making such an impression um, on that Baltimore Orioles team. Gunnar Henderson is. And the Orioles have Adley Rushman, of course, former top prospect Gunnar Henderson, and also Grayson Rodriguez returning from an injury in their minor league season. So their team, even before this, you know, quote unquote rebuild began this year, having a very, very promising year. And from what their, you know, their farm system's looking like, they're going to be a very competitive team, possibly in the AL East, uh, you know, better than the Red Sox. 
going forward. Uh, I'm also going to include social media in this little segment here. Just going to go through it quickly. We got Josh Reddick playing for the Savannah Bananas. Played one game for the Bananas this week. Of course, the team that everyone loves. They do the funny dance trends uh, and all the social media trends. It's been over a year since Reddick has appeared in the MLB, but he came out to play for the Bananas received a standing ovation, and I think he actually hit a walk-off home run and made a diving play in right field. And after he hit that walk-off home run, he ripped his jersey open to reveal his Spider-Man shirt uh, because apparently he loves Spider-Man and had a Spider-Man-themed wedding, which I actually learned when I was researching this. Not my cup of tea, but it's cool to see Josh Reddick, you know, back, back in baseball and, you know, getting the fans involved. And the Bananas are a class organization, I, I would like to say myself. Next, we got some guy named Mark getting friend zone on the jumbo trying to the Brewers game. So the Brewers had their happy birthday board up where, you know, put your announcements up there. Uh, will you marry me? Congratulations. Happy birthday. You know, whatnot. And one of the entries said, Mark, your friendship means the world to me. Let's not wreck it. So Mark got absolutely friend zone, absolutely, you know, embarrassed in front of the stadium. And then people posted it on Instagram. So then, of course, that goes viral and even more people see it. Um, but on a positive note, Christian Yelich did dedicate the game to Mark uh, when they were down two in the eighth. And, the you know, the Brewers ended up winning. So, you know, he got his heart broken maybe a little. But then the Brewers at least took home the W. Finally, we got Ichiro Girl and Ichiro meeting at Ichiro's, uh, you know, when he was honored and put in the Mariners Hall of Fame. The Mariners honored Ichiro this week. And in 2010, Ichiro was reaching for a foul ball in the right field stands. And he ended up, you know running into this fan and she got excited. They didn't run into her, but you know, they, they made contact and they were near each other. And the girl got really, really excited to touch Ichiro and be near Ichiro. So then she was then nicknamed the Ichiro girl all the way back in 2010. And then for the Mariners honoring Ichiro for that whole, you know, extravaganza, she threw out the first pitch of the game, but she didn't know that she was throwing it to Ichiro. So then she got to throw it to her favorite player. Um, and, you know, he signed a baseball for her. They had a little conversation and the whole day got off, went off without a hitch. And it was just an incredible day for Ichiro and just an incredible day for e the Ichiro girl as well. And next, we're going to go to our Today in Baseball history, as well as our Not Your Father's Baseball player. Uh, and we'll be right back. So finally, for our history segment, my favorite part of the show, as I always say, we're starting out with today in baseball history, 1971, Cesar Sedano. It's a 200-foot home run. Uh, Sedano was the Houston Astros outfielder and in a game versus the LA Dodgers. The bases were loaded for Cesar Sedano, team down 3-2. to two. He hit a blooper off of Claude Osteen into the right field, that little area where it might dink and dunk in. Bill Buckner and Jim Lefebvre did collide in the right field second base little gap over there and the ball trickled into the corner. By the time the ball was collected by an outfielder, it was an inside the park home run for Cesar Sedano. So it does mean he hit an inside the park grand slam going. It said between 170 and 200 feet, which is Little League, which is too short for Little League probably. Uh, but Sedano was most notably known for his gold glove fielding. He won five gold gloves. And he was the second player in history to hit 20 home runs and 50 stolen bases. And he did it three times. So Cesar Sedano, very, very important, very successful MLB player. But it is cool to see him hit a 200-foot inside the park grand slam. It's like video game stuff. You really can't make it up. In 2003, we're going to the new Blue Jays logo that they unveiled. The Blue Jays were coming off a pretty terrible logo that they only kept for one year. They kind of ripped off the Texas Rangers tee and they put a little uh, bird in front of it, a blue jay in front of it that had muscles. It was like flexing and had like a red maple leaf tattoo on his arm. It was like a really manly logo, but it definitely didn't have any staying power because eventually it got, you know, replaced in a single year, which is, you know, pretty bad because then you have to spend all the money on making new jerseys and all the marketing for the new logo. I bet they didn't really see that coming. But then they unveiled the new Jays logo uh, where it spelled out Jays and then it had a little blue Jay head on the J. Uh, this logo reminds me of Alex Rios, uh, Vernon Wells, and the Bigs 2 video game, which I always talk about because that's the logo that they were using. Uh, and I actually saw the Blue Jays playing these jerseys once in 
2008 or nine in California when they were playing the Angels. I think it was when Mike Trout might have been like, I don't know if he was in the league at that point, but probably a prospect. So, you know, the Angels were tremendous either. But 2012, they did revert back to a classic inspired Blue Jays uh, uniform, which they use now, which me personally, I like a lot more. And I didn't even like these Jays jerseys that they unveiled in 2003. I thought they they were trying to, you know, go for like a more futuristic, modern look. Um, and I really didn't like it. I thought it was, you know, bland. And a lot of teams are really trying to focus on, you know, reminiscing on the past. And I do like these, you know, inspired, past inspired jerseys they're using now. 2020, we got Tom Seaver's family announcing his passing. The Hall of Famer battled dementia as well as COVID. Um, and he battled dementia for years earlier. He did die. He did pass away a few days earlier than the announcement, but this was the day when the family formally announced it. Of course, Tom Seaver, Hall of Famer, won 311 games with a 286 career ERA, three time Cy Young winner, 12 time All Star, won the 1969 World Series with the, with the Mets, three time wins leader, three time ERA leader, and five time strikeout leader. So it was just a sad day for one of the, you know, baseball's best. Um, and we want to remember Tom Seaver today um, based on that day in 2020. We got two birthdays this week. I wanted to include Gabby Sanchez because I always used to call Gary Sanchez Gabby Sanchez. And I was like, there's got to be a player named Gabby Sanchez that I'm thinking of. Uh, but inevitably, I knew I was right. He was born in 1983. He's 39 years old. He was born in Miami, Florida, 15 round pick out of high school to the Seattle Mariners. But he decided to go to the University of Miami for a couple of years was then drafted by the Marlins in the fourth round of 2005, staying at home in Miami, debuted in 2008, had a seven-year career and was a one-time All-Star in 2011. He played with the Marlins most notably and the Pirates for a couple of seasons at the end of his uh, career. Career 254 hitter, 744 OPS and 103 OPS plus. So slightly above average, you know, an average MLB player. Uh, could be forgotten, but I wanted to make sure he was not forgotten. After his MLB career, he went to the NPO and then went on to sign a minor league deal with the Mariners, the team that originally drafted him um, in 2006 or 2016, but was eventually released. Um, just wasn't a player he was anymore at that time. So happy birthday, Gabby Sanchez. And as I mentioned before, Willie Adamas does make an appearance on the show again. He's turning 27 years old, born in the DR, Dominican Republic, signed with the Tigers all the way back in 2012. And I feel like that's such a long time ago, but people can sign at such a young age now. Um, Willie Adams was inevitably traded to the Rays in a David Price deal that sent David Price to the Tigers. Big deal in terms of David Price, but Willie Adams could have been a little forgotten piece. Willie Adams then went on to debut in 2018 and was sent over to the Brewers in 2021 from the Rays, as we mentioned before. Adamas is 255 career hitter with a 771 OPS and 110 OPS plus. So a very decent, productive young player that the Brewers have their hands on right now. And he also came 16th in MVP voting last year after an explosive start with the Brewers. Finally, we got Not Your Father's baseball player. And today we got Ken Obergfell. Ken Obergfell was born in Highland, Illinois. Signed with the Cardinals in 1975 and played until 1992. Played with the Cardinals, Braves, Pirates, Giants, Astros, and Angels, most notably for the Cardinals and Braves. He won the World Series in 1982 with the Cardinals alongside Ozzie Smith, the Hall of Famer, one of the best fielders of all time. Uh, and they were playing against the Brewers and Paul Molitor in that World Series, which they won. Obergfell was a career 278 hitter with a 97 OPS plus, so... A bit under average in terms of hitting, but did have a 973 fielding percentage. He did play most notably at third base, but he also had, I believe, over 400 career games at second. So a humongous, valuable utility guy in his career. He also was part of the Bearded Braves, which I never heard of before. But basically, it was a bunch of Braves player who grew up beards in the 80s alongside Glenn Hubbard and Bruce Sutter. Um, they grew the beards because they wanted to stand out and, you know, the clean shaven look in terms of the Yankees and people just not having beards and not having tattoos and hair like they do today. These guys were kind of front runners in that trend. Obergfell 
was also the minor league manager of the year in 2005, also went on to be a Mets bench coach and also coached in the Mexican League, but decided to retire in 2015. And what my dad had to say about this was when the Cardinals won the 1982 World Series, he was a solid player for that team. I agree. Solid fielder, decent hitter, better fielder, um, incredible, you know, clutch utility guy that they would need. Uh, and he was a great all around player and played multiple positions, which I just, you know, proved my dad correct. So that's Ken Obergfell, and that's our show for today. Uh, thank you guys for staying tuned. I'm trying to get everything back on the schedule, uh, posting everything maybe on Thursdays. Today, this one's probably going to come out Friday just because i got a lot of postseason stuff to do with uh, Frontier League, but trying to get back on track and stay on Instagram and put these shows together for you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tunnel Vision Sports. Thank you, Stephen Hayes, and everyone over there that puts the show together. And we'll be back next week for you guys.